Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. The wife got into bad company and what did it get her into? Today's story has a similar plot. Enjoy the show! Sitting down at my desk, I looked at my watch. It was just a few minutes before 4 p.m. In about an hour, I'll head home to start the weekend. I always look forward to the weekend, but this one was special. Tomorrow, Saturday, marks 20 years since I married Katie, and I couldn't wait to take my beautiful wife away for the weekend to have wild night at the lake house I had booked. I took the photograph of Katie that was lying on my desk and looked at it carefully. It was a photo she gave me many years ago. It was inscribed as follows, to the love of my life, Tom. By the way, it's me, Thomas West, Tom to my friends and family. Katie and I were in love in high school and got married shortly after graduating. From high school, Katie insisted that we wait until our wedding day to have a night. She said it would have made our honeymoon so much better. I have to admit she was right. My parents were happy for us and gave me a check for $100,000 and the keys to the townhouse they were using as a rental property just to start. My father told me then this money, he explained, was the first installment of a $5 million trust fund he first set up for me shortly after I was born. He added that I would receive a similar payment every year. He told me that he started the foundation shortly after my biological mother died. I knew she died shortly after I was born, but I never pressed him about it, and he never talked about her. About a year after her death, he remarried to the woman I knew as mom. I considered enlisting in the military after high school, but I was rejected due to being diagnosed with diabetes as a child. It was kept under control through diet and a regimen of pills I took every day, but I didn't let it stop me from playing soccer or taking martial arts classes. Katie and I went to college together. She wanted to become a teacher, and I wanted to follow my father's example into the world of business. Our plans were disrupted when Katie became pregnant with our only child, Jim, just six months after our wedding. Katie had a very difficult time giving birth to him, and on the advice of our doctor, had her fallopian tubes tied after he was born. She took time off from college to care for our son and returned after he started kindergarten. She received her teaching certificate and went to work at a local elementary school. In the meantime, I graduated and went to work for Ryder Industries as an accountant. I remember the day I told my dad about my job. Ryder Industries, right? He asked. Ryder Industries had been in business for almost 75 years and was a very well-established manufacturing and logistics company. They had a huge customer base across the country and an impressive portfolio with great potential for growth. Yes, I told him. They start with the fact that I work as an accountant. Good salary and benefits are amazing. Fine, I'm proud of you, son, he said. I hope everything works out for you. I remember being somewhat taken aback by the way he made his comment. I could tell that although he was proud of me, something else was bothering him. I wanted to ask him about this, but I restrained myself. My father wasn't the type to volunteer more information than necessary, and I knew pestering him about it would get me nowhere. The next 16 years were what you might call normal. We worked, came home, took care of our family, lather, rinse, repeat. My job didn't require any travel except for the occasional seminar, but we took time out for an annual vacation, usually during the summer months when Katie didn't have to work. I stopped taking martial arts classes about five years after I got married due to lack of time. I think raising a child in addition to working and taking care of the home tends to lead to this. I didn't talk about my job very often, but my father suggested several times that I explore my options. I couldn't help but wonder why he suggested this but I dropped the subject. Overall, Katie and I were happy. Of course, we had our ups and downs like every married couple, but overall everything was fine. Our personal life was fairly stable but declined a bit as we got older. However, about a month ago, I began to notice some changes in Katie. At first, I chalked it up to the fact that school was over and she didn't have to go to work every day. She had periods when she became withdrawn and distant. A few times she got a little harsh with me. I couldn't understand what I had done and tried to talk to her about it. She simply waved me off with a wave of her hand before walking away. A little later, she returned, apologizing for her behavior. Around this time, I learned that I was being considered for the vice president position that had just opened up. 
I was told that I was one of two people applying for this position. I later learned that the other candidate being considered was Alex Marlowe. Alex was a good man who deserved a promotion, but I thought I was better suited for the job. I didn't tell anyone about the promotion, deciding to wait until I knew for sure one way or another. So, I didn't think it had anything to do with it. And then it dawned on me, everything in the house was changing. Jim had just graduated from high school and received an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point. In fact, he was on his way there now. Perhaps, I thought, she was worried about the idea of becoming lonely. That's when I came up with the idea for a weekend away to celebrate our anniversary. I decided to surprise her, hoping that it would bring her out of her stupor. The phone on my desk rang at 4.15, bringing me back to reality. I picked up the phone and was greeted by the voice of my secretary. Mr. West, she said, Mr. Henderson just called and said you need to meet him as soon as possible. Thank you, Rhonda, I said. Jacob Henderson III, or Jake as he liked to be called, was the CEO of Ryder, and when he demanded your presence, you didn't keep him waiting. I decided that he wanted to talk to me about a promotion. I stood up, looked in the bathroom mirror, straightened my tie, and headed to the elevator. On the way up, I pulled my smartphone out of my pants pocket and set the audio recording function to record for an hour, just in case. I always did this when I went into meetings for later review, just in case I missed something important. I put the phone back in my pocket just as the elevator stopped. I got off on the 15th floor, the floor that housed all of the company's top executives, and headed to Henderson's suite, which occupied most of one end of the floor. His assistant, an attractive brunette named Brenda Harris, looked up at me as I entered. Mr. Henderson is expecting you, Mr. West, she said with a slight grin. I wondered what caused that smirk. What's going on here? I asked myself. Come on in, I nodded my head and opened the double doors to Henderson's main office. Oh, Tom, come in, he said with a smile, inviting me inside. I walked in and sat down in the chair he indicated, which stood directly opposite the sofa and coffee table set up at one end of the office. Get Mr. West something to drink, okay, Harvey, he ordered, looking at the large man in the suit. I knew that Harvey Strauss was one of Jake's personal guards, and I wondered where the other guard was. Henderson always kept two guards with him for some reason that escaped me. I've heard rumors over the years, but none of them have ever been confirmed. Harvey poured some bourbon into a glass and handed it to me. I didn't drink very often, but Harvey knew that I preferred straight bourbon, just like my father. I accepted the glass and thanked him. Harvey nodded his head but didn't say anything or even smile. Come to think of it, I don't think I've ever seen this man smile. Henderson walked over to the sofa and sat down. I noticed that he had taken off his jacket and rolled up the sleeves of his shirt. Henderson was a large man with a barrel chest and muscles. I thought he looked good for being over 50 years old. He took a sip of his drink, then set it on the coffee table and regarded me for a moment before speaking. Go on, he said with a smile. Drink something. It won't kill you if you relax a little. I took a test sip of the bourbon before placing the glass on the coaster he had on the coffee table. Thank you, I said. What can I do for you today, Mr. Henderson? Jake smiled before saying anything. That's what I like best about you, Tom, he said. Always so polite, always so kind. I was telling Brenda a couple of days ago that I don't think I've ever seen you worry about anything. By the way, how are things going on the home front? Is everything okay between you and your wife? I nodded my head. Yes, everything is fine, I said. Our son just left for West Point, so we're adjusting to that. I was planning on taking Katie out this weekend to celebrate our 20th anniversary. Married for 20 years, Jake asked. Congratulations. Well, I didn't call you here to mess with you. It's not that I don't like you, I like you. I wanted to talk to you about my upcoming promotion. As you know, this only applies to you and Marlo. There are only one or two things the board needs before making a decision. I see, I said. And what does the board need? They want to know how flexible you are, Jake said. How do you react to stressful situations? How far are you willing to go to achieve the company's goals? Do you understand that when you become a manager, your workday will not end at five as it is now? 
I figured that was true, at least up to a point, I said. Surely the board looked at my reviews, looked at my personal file. Yes, of course they did, Jake said. But they need more. They have to see for themselves how you can react under fire, so to speak. Sorry, Mr. Henderson, but I'm afraid I don't quite understand, I said. He smiled and took another sip of bourbon. You will understand this, my boy, he said. Tell me, how strong is your marriage? Very solid, Mr. Henderson, I said, taking another sip of my drink. Why are you asking? Glad to hear it. You see, I'm afraid you'll have to cancel your plans for the weekend, he said. If your marriage is as strong as you say, I'm sure your wife will understand. He looked at Harvey and nodded slightly. Harvey walked to the other door, opened it, and came back to stand behind my chair. I felt a little uncomfortable about this and wondered what was going to happen. Then I saw another guard, Lenny Jameson, come through the door, but he was not alone. Katie was with him. He led her to Henderson and stepped back. I was shocked by what I saw. Katie was wearing a very short dress with an open back. The front of her dress was open all the way to her waist, and it was clear that she wasn't wearing a bra. The hem of the dress fell just a couple of inches below her butt. She looked in my direction but did not seem to recognize me. I looked at her face and saw her eyes. She appeared to be drugged, and I thought I saw something white in one nostril. Katie, I said, what are you doing here? Why are you dressed like that? She looked at me but didn't answer. Her eyes appeared glassy, and it was obvious that she had been drugged. I looked back at Henderson. What does all of this mean? I asked. Why is she here in this outfit? She's clearly drugged. What did you give her? He laughed at my question. Come on, Tom, he said. You are a clever boy. What do you think she's doing here? And yes, I gave her something. Something I prepared myself. It makes them hot, wet, and pliable. Keeps them in this state for a very long time. I even gave her three times the usual dose. He nodded to Lenny, who untied the strip of fabric from the back of her neck. When he released her, her breasts were exposed. Henderson reached out and pinched one of her breasts. Katie didn't answer. I started to get up but found that I could not move my arms or legs. What the heck? And then it dawned on me. Harvey had also slipped something into my drink. Henderson looked at me with an evil grin on his face. He looked back at Lenny, who was standing behind Katie, and nodded his head. Lenny unzipped her dress, and it fell to the floor. Apart from her high heels, Katie was now completely without clothes. She still didn't move. I prefer my women to be shaved, he said. Aren't you, Shek? Not your woman, I said angrily. Oh, now I see that you are starting to worry, he said. And we're just getting started. He extended his hand and ran his finger over her butt. Get thee away from my wife. I blurted out in rage as Harvey held me back with both hands. Henderson looked at me and laughed. Or what? He asked threateningly. Will you kick my fifth place? If I haven't made a mistake in my calculations, you can't even move right now. Get away from her, you son of A. I growled. Henderson laughed again and unzipped his pants. He dropped his trousers and boxers and motioned for Lenny to come over. The big man pushed Katie to her knees in front of Henderson. That's when she began to satisfy him, and then they had into him. Her eyes remained glazed over as she made a sound in pleasure. It was as if nothing else mattered to her and nothing else existed in her universe. At this point, I was shaking with rage and fighting to free myself from Harvey, but I still couldn't move my arms. I looked back at Henderson. I'm going to kill you, you son of A. I shouted. Henderson just looked at me with a smirk. Well, is it really possible to talk to your own flesh and blood like that? He asked. Such language, and in front of your dear, sweet wife. She won't be my wife for long, I said angrily. And what do you mean by flesh and blood? Oh, you mean no one ever told you? He asked. They told me, I answered. How did my father knock up your biological mother in front of her husband? Henderson said with a grin. That's right, West. You and I are half-brothers. That's not true, I said, shocked. 
Why are you doing it, actually? For several reasons, he said. Firstly, because I am the general director and I can do whatever I want. Call it executive privilege if you want. Secondly, I always wanted to coddle my younger half-brother. You don't think I brought you on board because of your grades or abilities, do you? You mean? I began. That's right, West, he said. I knew your biological mother's husband when he worked here for my father. At that time, I was a young man who had not even finished high school. I worked here during the summers and weekends, mostly in the post office. I worked my way up the ranks, and now I occupy the position that my father once had. I kept an eye on you, and when I saw that you graduated from college, I made it clear that if you applied for a job here, you would be hired. Have you been planning this all along? I asked. Of course, he said. I call it the long game. I knew this time would come. It was just a matter of time. And now, your fifth place belongs to me, and your wife belongs to me. This brings me to the third reason I do this. I intend to return what was taken from my father. What do you mean taken from your father? I asked. I've never met your father. No, but the man you called dad did it, Henderson said. He sued my father and the company. Where do you think the money for your trust fund came from? Now, I intend to take back what is mine, and I'm going to take it out of your wife's fifth place. You sick, you know that? I asked. He shrugged. Maybe, he said. It is what it is. So here's how it's going to work, Tom. You are not going to divorce your wife. She will need extra money to support her new lifestyle. As I said, she belongs to me now. She will become my personal corporate available girlfriend, and you will never touch her again. She should be available to me upon request, 24-7. In fact, I'm taking her to New York for a couple of days or so to present to the board of directors. They also showed interest in her. Don't worry, I'll bring her back, maybe a little shabby. You'll never get away with this, I said. He laughed. I've already done it, he said. And there's not a damn thing you can do to stop me. He looked at Lenny and nodded his head. Lenny stood in front of me and grinned. It's nothing personal, Mr. West, he said. I've always liked you. I'm just doing my job. With these words, he hit me hard in the face. I saw stars and finally lost consciousness after the third blow. I woke up and immediately realized that I was in a hospital room. I heard buzzing and beeping sounds from the instruments attached to me and saw the plastic four in my arm. My mouth was dry and my head hurt terribly. I looked around and saw my dad sitting on the chair next to my bed. He looked like he hadn't slept in forever. He heard me move and looked at me. He saw that I was trying to speak and called the nurse. A young woman in a nurse's uniform entered the room and checked my vital signs before giving me a piece of ice to suck on. She gave me another one after the first one melted. After eating a couple more cubes, I licked my lips and tried to speak. How long? I asked. You've been here about four days. Dad said as the nurse left the room to call the doctor. Four days? I asked in shock. This means that it's Tuesday? Correct, said my father. I got a call from the hospital late on Friday evening. They said you were dumped in front of the emergency room. You haven't been home since then. What happened to you, son? Later, I said, seeing the doctor enter my room. Good afternoon, Mr. West, he said. I'm Dr. Pierce. I'm glad to see you with us again. How do you feel? It's like I was run over by a truck, I said. Everything hurts. I have no doubt about it, he said. You've been pretty beat up. Nothing is broken, but you have a couple of bruised ribs and a small bruise. We were concerned that you might have had a concussion. He examined me and made notes on my chart. We're going to take some x-rays and I want to keep you one more night for observation. If everything goes well, we can send you home tomorrow. I took it upon myself to call the police, Dad said. It was very clear to me that you were under attack, and we have a responsibility to report possible criminal activity. I know they want to talk to you. Do you think you can handle this? Yes, doctor, I said. Most definitely. 
Okay, he said. I'll call them, and maybe they'll be here by the time you get back. He waved to the nurse, and she called. A few minutes later, I was taken to radiology for an x-ray. When I returned to my room, a man in a suit was talking to my father. After I settled in, the man in the suit pulled out a set of ID cards and introduced himself. Mr. West, I'm Detective Ryan Blackstone, he said. Can you tell us how this happened? Yes, I can, I told him, taking a sip of water. I told him everything I could. Then I remembered my phone. Did you find my phone? I asked my father. Yes, he said. Your mother brought the charger and plugged it into the outlet. I thought you might need this. He turned off the phone, which was lying on the table next to my bed, and handed it to me. I noticed there were a few text messages from a couple of numbers I didn't recognize and decided to check them later. I found the audio recording I had made and played it back for the detective. We could hear everything, including the blows on my body. I paid special attention to what happened after my beating. Okay, get him out of here, we heard Henderson say to the two guards. Take him out the back door and take him to the hospital. If anyone asks, just say that's how you found him. Got it? Got it, boss, I heard Lenny's voice. We heard movement, probably from the guards who were dragging me. Then we heard them talking as they pushed me into the back seat of the car. Careful, Harvey, said one. I don't want to get blood on the seats. I'm trying, but he's such a son of A, Lenny said. Aren't they all like that? Harvey said, laughing. We heard the door slam, then the recording ended. We have video from the hospital security system, Ryan said. According to this, they drove up, opened the door, and threw you into the parking lot before driving away. A couple of EMTs saw you lying there and took you inside. We were able to see the car's license plate. It's registered to Ryder Industries. I called your HR department on Monday morning to let them know where you were, and they told me that Henderson already said you'd be on sick leave for a week, Dad said. Any new news from Katie? I asked. Dad shook his head. No, son, he said. None. I've been trying to call you at home and on her cell phone ever since I got the call from the hospital. I left voicemails but never heard from her. She's probably still in New York, I said. God only knows what they did to her. I will put her on the wanted list, a bulletin on all counts, Ryan said. Do you have a recent photograph of her? Yes, there is, I said, pulling out my photographs. Okay, he said. Send this to me along with a copy of that audio recording. I will send the photo to the NYPD and ask them to do the same. I will also issue a warrant for the arrest of Henderson and his thugs and forward it to the NYPD. I assume you want us to press charges? Absolutely true, I said. Okay, he said. Then we'll figure it out ourselves. Mr. West, you just relax and let the professionals do their job, okay? Okay, detective, I said. Thank you. We'll be in touch, Ryan said. We may have some questions later. He pulled out a business card and handed it to me. Call me if you remember anything else. After he left the room, I looked at my father. Is what Henderson said true? I asked. Yes and no, said Dad. It's true that his father had his way with your biological mother, and it's true that he made me watch. But it turned out that your mother was already pregnant when this happened. She just didn't know it at the time. What happened? I asked. Well, after that happened, I filed for divorce, he said. She kept telling me it was just a mistake that she still loved, you know, all that usual nonsense. But I wasn't going to hear it. I moved into the guest bedroom and refused to have anything to do with her. I also filed an alienation of affection lawsuit against Henderson and company for allowing this to happen. In those days, I could still do it. Soon after, she found out she was pregnant, and the court forced us to wait until you were born before moving forward. Could you do a DNA test? I asked. You were born in 1982, said Dad. This was before they used DNA to establish paternity. We took blood tests, but they were inconclusive. It turns out that you, me, your biological mother, and Henderson have the same blood type. I won't bore you with all the details, but things in the house only got worse. 
your biological mother began to abuse alcohol and pills. She died of an overdose about six months after you were born. Damn, I said. The lawsuit against Henderson and Ryder continued, and we settled it out of court, my father said. That's where I got the money to start your trust fund. As part of the agreement, I agreed not to disclose any details about this case. That's why I couldn't tell you anything about it. About a year after all this, I met Patricia. She fell in love with you the moment she saw you for the first time. She insisted on adopting you after we got married. She could not have children of her own, but in her opinion, you were and remain her son. So, how did you know that I was really your son? I asked. Do you remember that motorcycle accident you had when you were 16? He asked. I remembered it too well. One day, I was riding on the back of Jimmy Reardon's bike. He was usually very careful, but that day, he hit a slippery spot on the road, and we fell. Fortunately, we were both wearing helmets, and this saved our lives. However, I was still pretty beat up. Yes, I remember, I said. Well, I asked the hospital to do a DNA test, he said. I just had to find out the truth one way or another. The test came back and showed that there is more than a 99% chance that I am your father. This means that your biological mother was already pregnant with you when Henderson had her. Well, as far as I am concerned, you are my father no matter what any test shows, I told him, making him smile. What happened to Henderson? I asked. He died of a stroke around the time you went to college, Dad said. His son took a step forward and became general director. I had hoped that the younger Henderson had learned from his father's mistakes, but it appears I was wrong. That's why you weren't particularly enthusiastic about me going there to work, isn't it? I asked. He nodded his head. Yes, he said. I wanted to tell you, but I couldn't. I pray to God that I have this now. It's not your fault, Dad, I said. I just don't know how Katie could fall for his after all these years. It just doesn't make any sense. Who knows, said Dad. It looks like she was drugged and out of control. She may have been drugged, but something just doesn't sound right, I said. First of all, what was she doing there and wearing this dress? Just at that moment, we heard a knock on the door. Yes? I shouted. The door opened, and Brenda poked her head into the room. Can I come in? She asked meekly. Of course, Brenda, I said. Come in. What do you want? In her hands, she held a vase full of flowers and a large card. I wanted to bring this, she said. Everyone in the office chipped in and bought it for you. They also signed the card. Thank you, Brenda, I said. Put the flowers over there, I added, pointing to the nightstand next to the bed. She handed me a card and placed the flowers on the nightstand. Then she turned to face me. I want you to know that I'm really sorry about all of this, she said. Did you know what Henderson was planning to do? I asked. I knew he was planning something with your wife, she said. I didn't know about this, she added, pointing at me. What's happened? I asked. That morning he gave me a company credit card and told me to pick up your wife, she said. He said that she was waiting for me. He told me to take her out and buy her the shortest, prettiest dress we could find and take her downstairs to get her hair done. He also insisted that she wax her bikini area, a complete Brazilian wax. I had a pretty good idea of what he meant. This is not the first time he has done this. So your boss is using you to train his little girls? Dad asked. Brenda's face turned red and she had the good sense to look down. Did you know that he drugged her? He pills all the women he sleeps with, Mr. West, she said. He loves to experiment. Has he ever used it on you? Dad asked. She nodded her head. One day, she said, he gave me just a little bit. He said it was only a quarter of the usual dose, made me last an hour or so. Do you know how much he gave my wife? I asked. She shook her head. No, I don't know, she said. He said he gave Katie three times the usual dose, I said. Her eyes widened and she brought her hands to her face. Oh my God, she said. I had no idea. Your poor wife must have been climbing the walls for hours. 
I bet she didn't even know you were in the room. This stuff really does a number on you. When I walked into your office, you knew what was going to happen, didn't you? I asked. She nodded her head. I knew, she said, but I didn't know he was going to treat you so cruelly. Do you know where Henderson and my wife are now? I asked. Last I heard, they're still in New York, she said. Would you agree to talk to the police? Dad asked. I will do everything in my power to help, she said. She looked back at me with tears in her eyes. I'm really, really sorry about this, Mr. West. Just one thing, Brenda, I said. Did my wife know what was going to happen? I asked. She nodded her head. I'm pretty sure she knew that, Mr. West, she said. I know that Mr. Henderson has spoken to her several times over the last month or so, and he has asked her out to dinner several times, long lunches. I don't know if they did anything or not, and he never told me. But do you think they did it? I asked. I would say it's very likely, but I really don't know, she said. You often do things like this for Henderson, don't you? Dad asked. Quite often, she said quietly. So you approve of his actions, he asked. She shook her head. You don't understand, she said. I'm a single mother with a special needs child, and Mr. Henderson pays me quite well for my help and my silence. Well, your silence is what got my son into the hospital this time, young lady, he said, starting to lose his temper. She backed away as he glared at her. Honestly, Mr. West, she said, I didn't know they were going to harm your son. I would have warned him if I had known. Dad leaned back in his chair and looked at her without saying anything. Brenda, I'll have the police detective contact you about this, I said. I suggest you be available and cooperate fully. You understand? She nodded her head. I understand, Mr. West, she said. Okay, I said. And tell everyone that I thanked you for the flowers and the card. I'll do so, she said, wiping a tear from her eye. Once again, I apologize. With these words, she turned and left the room. After the door closed, I turned and looked at my father. That explains something, I said. Katie has been acting a little strange since school ended. At first, I thought it was just because Jim had gone to West Point. Well, we'll get to the bottom of it, he said. There was another knock on the door, and a hospital orderly entered, wheeling a cart full of food. Dad smiled and stood up. Looks like it's time for dinner, he said. That means I'd better get home before your mother sends the National Guard to find me, he joked. Take care of yourself, son. Get some rest, and we'll see you in the morning. Thank you, Dad, I said. Tell Mom hello from me, and be sure to tell her that I love her. I'll do it, son, he said. And by the way, I love you too. He smiled as we bumped fists and then left the room. The orderly smiled at Dad as he left, then placed my food on the tray. It actually smelled pretty good, and I was a little hungry since it had been a few days since I last ate. I wolfed down my food, enjoying the meatloaf and mashed potatoes. I especially liked the mushroom sauce. It wasn't up to Mom's or Katie's standards, but it did the job. I even liked the broccoli, which I don't usually eat. I had finished my pudding cup and was sipping my coffee when I decided to check the text messages on my phone. There were four messages in total, and each of them had a video attached. The first message, dated later that Friday, simply read, Enjoy. I bet you wish you weren't here. I didn't recognize the number and opened the video. I immediately regretted doing it. The video began with Katie standing in front of a group of grinning men, wearing the same short dress she was wearing the last time I saw her. I recognized these men as members of the board of directors. This would only add millions to the lawsuit, I thought to myself. She stood silently as one of the men reached out, tore off her dress, and threw it on the floor. She began to satisfy the man. I saw that Katie's eyes were still glazed over, and I knew that she was under the influence of what Henderson had given her. I didn't know if it was because of what he gave her on Friday afternoon or if he gave her another dose. Luckily, the video ended because I felt like I was going to throw up. Gathering my courage, I opened the next message dated early Saturday morning and played the video. And again, I regretted doing this. In this video, 
Katie was having fun with several men at the same time. The third video from late Saturday night showed Katie lying on her back with her legs spread wide open and several men were having an intimate with her. The fourth video was different. The video, dated early Sunday morning, showed Henderson and Katie looking directly into the camera. I noticed that her eyes were bloodshot and there were large dark bags underneath them. I wonder how long they've been tormenting her, I thought. Henderson spoke first. I hope you liked what you saw, he said. This is your wife's new life, so you better get used to it. He turned to Katie before speaking again. Tell that who I am, honey, he said. Jake Henderson is my master, she said in a voice devoid of emotion. That's true, he said. And what's your new job? Henderson asked. I am my master's without clothes and toy, she said. I'm doing intimate with whomever he says, whenever he says it, and however he says it, as much as he says. Very good, said Jake. And tell that that he will never touch you again, he cockled. You'll never be able to touch me again, Katie said, pointing her finger at the camera. Henderson laughed at that before looking into the camera. And remember, don't rock the boat, or the next time I ask Harvey and Lenny to talk to you, you might not wake up. See you later, cockled. Bye. As this video ended, I experienced a whole range of emotions, hatred, anger, sadness, disappointment. I couldn't believe what I just saw and heard. As far as I could tell, he was able to get her. I looked at the wedding ring on my finger. It no longer had any meaning to me, so I took it off and threw it on the nightstand. Maybe, I thought, I could sell it and get a few dollars for it at a pawn shop. At that moment, I had no doubt that I would divorce Katie. I really didn't care if Jake liked it or not. I also intended to make him pay, but how? Alienation of affection lawsuits were possible when my father filed for divorce, but no more. I wanted to kill that idiot, but honestly, he wasn't worth going to jail for. I called Ryan and told him about the videos and Henderson's threats. He asked me to forward them to him and said he would contact me. I followed his instructions and turned off my phone. I thought about calling Kathy but decided that would be a futile exercise. I put my phone on the nightstand and watched some TV to take my mind off what I had just seen. Eventually, I fell asleep and dreamed of happier times when I had a loving and faithful wife. The next morning, I woke up to the sounds of nurses in my room checking my vital signs and looking at the monitors. Two of them took me to the radiology department and took some more x-rays, then took me back to my room. After they got me back on my feet, the orderly brought breakfast. Dr. Pierce came into my room shortly after I had finished my bacon and egg breakfast and told me the good news, everything had gone well, and I could go home. He wrote a prescription for the pain and gave me a series of instructions. The discharge paperwork will take about an hour, so why don't you call your parents and ask them to come pick you up, he said. By the time they get here, you'll be fine. Take care of yourself, and I want you to make an appointment with your regular doctor within a week. Thanks, doc, I said. I'll do so. After he left, I called my parents and told them the good news. About an hour later, they appeared in my room. Mom hugged me. She looked at me, and I saw tears in her eyes. Oh, Tom, I'm so sorry this happened to you, she said. How do you feel? It's been better, Mom, I told her. Well, I made some of my lasagna for you and put it in the oven to keep it warm, she said. I really liked my mother's lasagna. It was the most delicious with several layers of cheese, mushroom, and meat filling. It was the most delicious food in the world. I looked at her and smiled. Thank you, Mom, I said. I appreciate it. Your lasagna always brings a smile to my face. I'm glad, son, she said. Your father told me what happened, and I feel so bad. I have every reason to throw this woman over my knee and whip her fifth place, Dad, and I looked at each other and laughed. I had no doubt that she would have thrown Katie over her knee if she had been here. So, is there any news? Dad asked. I told him about the videos and Henderson's threats. Video? Mom asked. Trust me, Mom, you really don't want to see them, I said. They are worse than bad. I understand, she said. You'll need the name of a good divorce lawyer, Dad said. Yes, I said. 
I don't see any way to forget what she did, which she's probably still doing. I also need to tell Jim. He will be heartbroken. Okay, I'll make a few calls, Dad said. Just then, a nurse came into the room and handed me discharge papers and instructions. They insisted that I ride in a wheelchair, so the nurse sat me down and wheeled me around while Mom and Dad walked next to me. We got to the loading dock, and I climbed into the back seat. Dad drove us back to my house, stopped at a pharmacy along the way so I could buy my pain pills. I noticed my car was parked in the driveway when we pulled up there. Your mom and I picked up your car from Ryder on Saturday, Dad said. Katie's car is still in the garage. We stopped and entered the house. I looked around and realized how empty the place seemed without Katie. I smelled lasagna in the oven, and it cheered me up a bit. I hope you don't mind, but yesterday afternoon I took the liberty of freshening things up a little, Mom said. It was starting to get a little musty. I don't mind at all, Mom, I told her. Thank you for all. I think I can handle all of this. Just at that moment, we noticed a dark sedan parked in front of the house. I saw Ryan get out on the driver's side, and another man in a suit get out on the passenger side. I opened the door and invited them in. Detective Blackstone, I said, please come inside. I held the door open as the two men came inside. Ryan shook my hand as he entered. I introduced him to my mother, and they shook hands. Can I get you two something to drink? Mom asked. Coffee? Coca-Cola? Ryan shook his head. No, ma'am, but thank you anyway, Ryan said. He turned to the other man. Mr. West, this is Detective Hawthorne, NYPD Homicide Department. I was shocked for a moment when I realized this, but eventually I extended my hand, and Hawthorne accepted it. I invited them to sit down, and we all made ourselves as comfortable as we could. Homicide? I asked. Hawthorne nodded his head and held out the photograph. I looked up and saw Katie's face, but her eyes were closed, and her skin had a sickly tint. Can you identify the woman in this photograph? He asked. That sounds like my wife, Kathy, I said, but she was alive early Sunday morning. I have a video. Did your wife have any marks or tattoos? Asked Hawthorne. Yes, she had a tattoo of a small dolphin on her upper right thigh, I said. She did it on a dare 15 years ago. Hawthorne looked at Ryan and nodded his head before looking back at me. I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. West, but it appears that your wife may have been murdered, he said. Killed? I asked. How? When? That's what we're trying to determine, Mr. West, he said. The coroner is still examining her, but his initial assessment was that she died of a massive heart attack. That wouldn't make her death a murder, would it? I asked. Well, her body was found in a shallow grave in the middle of Central Park yesterday afternoon, Hawthorne said. In my experience, this usually indicates murder. We're still waiting on toxicology test results, and maybe that will shed some light on what happened. What can you tell us? I told them both the whole story. Ryan listened and took notes, even though he had heard it all before. I pulled out my phone and let them listen to the audio recording. Then I played the video for them. Mom didn't hear or see anything and started crying. Dad took her out of the room so I could talk to the detectives alone. When they finished watching the video, I told them what Brenda told me. They both made notes and looked at each other before turning to me. That explains the bruises and general condition of Mrs. West's body, said Hawthorne. He turned to me. This woman is Harris, Hawthorne began. Is she working today? As far as I know, I said. We need to talk to her, Hawthorne said to Ryan, who nodded his head in agreement. He turned to me again. What can you tell me about the pills Henderson mentioned? This so-called super ecstasy, he asked. Not much, just what Brenda told me and what I saw, I said. Doc said that what they used on me was already out of my body. What about Henderson and his goons? Ryan asked. It's one of those things we were hoping you could tell us, Ryan said. Henderson's corporate jet took off from New York last night according to the flight plan filed by its pilot. They were returning here, but there is no record of the plane landing here. Do you know where else he could have gone? Ryder has branches all over the country, I said. He could be anywhere. 
Great, Hawthorne said, looking at Ryan. We will need to get the FAA involved as well as the FBI. I have a contact at the local FAA office, Ryan said. We can go there after we execute a search warrant on Ryder. Hawthorne nodded his head. What is going to happen? I asked. If what you're telling us is true, this could become a federal case because Henderson took your wife across state lines, Ryan said. We're looking at several charges against him, including murder and possibly kidnapping. In the meantime, said Hawthorne, my men will complete their work and free your wife's body. This may take several days. We will also detain the people in this video and see what we can show them. I nodded my head in understanding. Ryan looked at Hawthorne before speaking. I'd like to speak to Mr. West alone if you don't mind, he said. Hawthorne looked at me and nodded his head. Of course, I understand, he said. I still need to make a couple of calls. I'll be right outside. He looked at me before continuing, I'm really sorry about all this, Mr. West, he told me. Thank you, detective, I said, shaking his hand. After he left, Ryan turned back to me. Mr. West, Tom, he began. I wanted to talk to you a little about what happened to your wife, and I wanted to do it in private. I appreciate it, Ryan, I said. I'll spare you the gory details, Ryan said, but from what I've read and seen, her last 48 hours were absolute hell. I spoke to a medical examiner in the East, and he confirmed my suspicions. I don't believe your wife agreed with what was done to her. I believe she was brutally attacked. She was used and abused by a bunch of power-mad animals. Look, Ryan, I understand what you're trying to do here, and I appreciate it, I said. I really understand. But the truth is that Katie and Henderson dated for a month before this happened. I don't know exactly what happened between them, but I have a pretty good idea. Katie could have stopped all of this any time before last Friday, but she didn't. I don't know why she did what she did, and now I'll never know. I understand, Ryan said quietly. He pulled out a business card from his pocket and handed it to me. I think you should consult Tom. Dr. Harmon is one of the best in the business. Call her. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you, I said. I'm worried that Henderson's thugs will come back for you, he said. I would assign a couple of officers to you, but I'm afraid we simply don't have the manpower for this. However, I will order the dispatcher to double patrols in your area. Do you have a gun? No, I said. Okay, he said. Then always keep your windows and doors closed and locked. If you suspect anything, call 911 immediately. I'll do it, Ryan, I said. Just at that moment, Hawthorne returned to the house. I just got off the phone with your partner, Johnson, he said. He is wanted throughout the country and we also received search warrants and are waiting for us. Ryan nodded his head and stood up. We'll be in touch, Tom, Ryan said, shaking my hand. Hawthorne extended his hand. I'm sorry for your loss, Mr. West, he said. Thank you, detective, I said. After they left, my parents came back and sat down. Are you going to be okay, son? Dad asked. I think so, Dad, I said. I have a couple of more calls to make, and I'm looking forward to them. In many ways, this was true. I needed to tell Jim what happened to his mother, and I also needed to call Katie's parents. Okay, if you need anything, call us, okay? Dad asked. I'll do that, Dad. Thanks, I said. We exchanged hugs and watched them leave. I called Jim on his cell phone and left a message. I thought it might be a while before he called me back. I definitely wasn't looking forward to the next call. Kathy's father, Bill Anderson, was a retired Marine colonel. He was a highly decorated combat veteran who earned the nickname Bloody Bill during a tour in Afghanistan. I never knew all the details, but from what I heard, he allegedly killed several Taliban fighters armed only with a knife. I saw him in uniform several times, and the man had more ribbons and medals than I had ever seen on a military man in my life. He and Katie's mother, Alice, moved into the country house several years ago after he left the army. The colonel, as we all called him, didn't hurt anyone, and I admit I was a little nervous telling him that his only child was now dead. Luckily, he and I got along well, and he insisted that I call him dad. 
I counted to ten and dialed the number. Anderson's residence, I heard Bill's voice when he picked up the phone. Dad, it's me, Tom, I said. Are you okay, son, he asked. You sound like someone just took all your cookies. No, Dad, it's not like that, I said. I just returned home from the hospital and found out that Katie is dead. Dead? He asked in shock. Hospital? What were you doing in the hospital? Is that where she died? What the hell happened? It's a little difficult, I said. Difficult? He asked. What do you mean difficult? I gave him the Reader's Digest version, and he thought for a moment. I could almost hear the gears grinding in his head as he processed it all. After a few moments, he spoke. We will be there at 16, he said. It's 4 p.m. for you civilian types. I know, Dad, I said, laughing. And make sure you have fresh coffee ready. I'll do so, I said. We ended the conversation, and I sat back in my chair, thinking about everything that had happened. Suddenly, the full realization of what had happened hit me, and I began to sob. I felt like I had lost everything that meant anything to me. My marriage had obviously broken down for some time, and I just didn't know it. And now, the only woman I've ever truly loved is gone too. As much as I hated what she did, I didn't want her to die. As for Henderson, it was a completely different matter. I got up and ate some of my mom's lasagna. This has always made me feel better in the past. It helped this time too. After eating, I cleaned everything up and walked around the house, thinking about my life together with Katie. Every nook and cranny of this place held memories for me. There is no way I could stay in this house. I decided that as soon as this was all over, I would sell the place and find something smaller. I found Katie's phone on the nightstand, still plugged into the charger. I decided to see if there was anything there that could give me a clue as to why she did what she did. Her phone was locked, but I knew the four-digit code she used and entered it. Of course, it happened right away. I saw that her phone had received several calls from Henderson and several from Brenda's work number. The latter was done that Friday morning. I looked through her text messages and saw a conversation with Henderson from a couple of months ago, but there wasn't much context, and they didn't say much in their messages. For all I knew, they could be talking about the weather. I also looked at her emails, but again, there was nothing there that raised any suspicions. I turned off the phone and put it back on the bedside table. Looking at the time, I realized that it was already 3.45 p.m. I had no idea how much time I wasted on Katie's phone. I knew how punctual the colonel was, so I went to the kitchen and made fresh coffee, strong just the way he liked it. The doorbell rang just as the digital clock on the coffee pot showed 4 p.m. I knew it was the colonel, so I opened the door and invited him and Alice inside. Damn it, son, didn't anyone ever teach you to dock? Asked the colonel, seeing my face. My father tried, but I don't think I ever fully figured it out, I said, half-jokingly. Come in. As they entered the house, another car pulled into the driveway and stopped. I saw a tall, lanky guy get out of the car and walk towards the door. I hope you don't mind, Bill said. After what you told me, I took the liberty of calling for reinforcements. By this time, the tall man was already in the house with a laptop bag on his shoulder. He was carrying two more bags and I wondered what was going on. Bill turned to the man. Ron, this is my brother-in-law, Tom West, he said. Tom, this is Ron Wiseman. We serve together in the Corps. Nice to meet you, Mr. Wiseman, I said, shaking his hand. Please, call me Ron, he said. I looked at the colonel. Ron and his wife have some experience with jerks like Henderson, he said. Also, he has a certain skill set that I think will come in handy. About? I asked. What kind of skills? I'm an accountant by training, said Ron. Accountant? I asked. Ron smiled as he set his bags down on the floor. Well, I'm a little more than that, he said. I'm doing some work for a special task force, and I happen to have access to information that, from what the colonel said, will be very useful. I see. I said. Well, sit down, and I'll go get us all some coffee. Alice joined me in the kitchen, and we returned with four large cups of coffee. The colonel liked it hot, fresh, black, and strong. 
Alice handed him the cup, and he took a tentative sip before placing it on the table. Not bad, Tom, he said. Thank you. Well, why don't you bring us all up to speed? I told them all about what happened up until Ryan and Hawthorne left the house earlier. You say you have video recordings? Asked the colonel. Yes, I said. They're pretty unsightly. I'd still like to see them, he said. Don't worry, I said. After 30 years in the Corps, there's not much that Alice and I haven't seen. I took out my phone and cued the video. They watched all four videos before returning the phone. I could tell Bill and Alice were very upset by what they saw. Ron, however, took it all in stride and paused the video several times to get a better look at the people involved. It's obvious she was drugged, Alice said. Bill and Ron nodded their heads in agreement. But what exactly? I don't know for sure, I told her. Brenda, Henderson's assistant, said he was working on some super ecstasy or something like that, and Henderson drugged you too, asked Ron. Yes, I said. But by the time I was treated in the hospital, it had already disappeared from my body. By this time, Ron had taken out his laptop and booted up. I gave it the password for my home wireless network, and it connected to the internet. Those two thugs who beat you up, said Ron. Were they on video? Yes, I said. I opened one of the videos and paused it so Ron could get a good look at it. Harvey Strauss and Lenny Jameson over there, I said, pointing to the two large men in the video. Can you send me these videos? Ron asked, giving me his email address. Of course, I said. I am redirecting the video. Ron confirmed receipt of the files and got to work. You know those aren't their real names, Ron said. No, I didn't know that, I said. What are they? They're ex-bandits, said Ron. They went missing after their boss, James Brolin, a.k.a. Jimmy the Weasel, was found murdered in his marital bed. The feds have been looking for them for some time. How long have they been working for Henderson? I think it's been a couple of years now, I said. Why do you ask? They went missing around this time, Ron said. Are you saying they put Henderson on the wanted list all over the country? Yes, I said. Okay, said Ron, clicking his mouse. Let's see what we can come up with. I'll leave this for a while. We talked while Ron let his program do its thing. So here's what we're going to do, the colonel said after we talked for a while. Ron agreed to stay here with you until these guys are out of action. I don't like the idea of you being here alone and they're still out there, he told me. Ron, let me know as soon as you hear anything about them, okay? Got it, Colonel, said Ron. What are you going to do? I asked Bill. It's better if you don't know, son, he said. Let's just say that we Marines take care of ourselves and leave it at that. Don't worry, one way or another, Henderson and his thugs will pay dearly. You said you're on sick leave until Monday? Yes, I said. What are your plans after this, he asked. There's no way I can stay in Ryder, not after this, I said. I thought a little and planned to hand in my resignation two weeks in advance on Monday. I'm also planning on selling this place and getting something smaller. I don't blame you, he said. Any word on when Katie's body will be released? It may be several days since Hawthorne told me, I said. If you need any help with final preparations, let us know, he said. Thank you, Dad. I appreciate it, I said. Bill stood up, signaling that the meeting was over. Alice and Ron stood up too. We better go, honey, he said to Alice. Ron, let me know as soon as you find out anything. I will do so, he said. Bill turned to me and surprised me with a fatherly hug. In all the years I knew him, I never saw him hug another man. Everything will be fine, son, he said. Alice moved closer when he released me and hugged me tenderly. I'm so sorry this happened, Tom, she said. Don't worry about anything, okay? I won't, Mom, I said. Thank you for coming. You're welcome, she said. And call if you need anything. My phone rang shortly after they left the house. I looked at the number and saw that it was Jim. I answered the phone and sat down next to him to tell him what happened. At first, he was shocked by this news. Dad, that just doesn't seem like something she could do, Jim said. 
I know, it doesn't make any sense to me either, I said. Are there any clues as to why she did this? He asked. No, son. I looked at her phone and email, but there's nothing there, I said. Maybe she has a burner phone somewhere, he said. A burner phone? I asked. Yeah, one of those disposable phones you throw away when you pay as you go, Jim said. Maybe she has one somewhere that you haven't found yet. My mind instantly switched to the videos they sent me. They came from a number I didn't recognize. Maybe it was her burner phone. If so, then no one could say where he was now. You might be onto something, I said. I didn't think about it. We talked a little more and ended the conversation with Jim asking me to let him know when his mother's body would be delivered for burial. After the call, I mentioned the burner phone idea to Ron. That makes sense, he said. If you have a number, I'll see what I can come up with. I gave it to him, and he launched another program and entered the number. A few minutes later, he had his answer. This number belongs to a phone bought here in the city, he said. As you expected, this is a burner phone. The number is registered to Ryder and was last identified Tuesday morning in NYC. There hasn't been any activity on it since you received the last video. Any idea where you might be now? None, I said. As far as we know, it was dismantled into pieces and thrown into the river. He went back to his computer, so I went upstairs and prepared a guest room for him because I had no idea how long he would be staying. He was still with me on Saturday, spending most of his time on the computer. I had no idea what he was doing, but we've gotten to know each other better since he arrived on Wednesday. He told me he was a sniper in the Marines and now works for a joint federal private task force. Although he was a certified public accountant, most of his work was related to research. He told me a little about what he and his wife Amy did with other executives who wanted to have their own way with her. I wasn't sure if he was telling me the truth or not, but they were interesting stories. The night before, he asked if I would mind if Amy joined him for the weekend. I gave him the go-ahead, and she arrived around 9 a.m. on Saturday morning. After he introduced us, they took her things to the guest room, and I slipped out to the garage to give them some privacy. After fiddling around in the garage for an hour or so, I went back inside. Ron and Amy were sitting in front of his computer, looking at something. Ron looked up as I entered. Any news? I asked. Yes, said Ron. Firstly, the FBI took over the investigation. Secondly, about half an hour ago, I received a confident hit on our targets, all three. I asked, yeah, they're near Colorado Springs, Ron said. I have already contacted the colonel, then he will figure it out himself. There is something else. What is it? I asked. I was able to see the official autopsy report on your wife, he said. About? I asked. What is written there? According to the report, your wife did suffer a massive heart attack from the chemicals Henderson gave her. But that's not what killed her, Ron said. They found soil particles in her lungs. What does it mean? I asked. She was alive when they buried her, said Ron. I felt like I had been punched in the gut. Barely alive, but alive nonetheless. I'm sorry, that's not all, more I asked in shock. There was also extensive bruising around her private parts, and a toxicology report showed huge amounts of a range of chemicals in her blood, including ecstasy and cocaine. I'm sorry, Tom, but it looks like the last few hours of her life were brutal. I can't believe she did all this voluntarily. What do you think happened? I asked. From what I've read, Henderson and his cronies probably had one hell of a party, he said. Your wife was so excited about what Henderson gave her that she simply couldn't control herself. Somewhere along the way, she had a heart attack. Instead of taking her to a hospital where she might survive, they probably thought she was dead, so they carried her out and buried her. I sat down, shocked by what Ron had just told me. Amy came over and hugged me as hot tears streamed down my face. Henderson and his goons are wanted for murder, conspiracy to commit murder, manufacture and use of a number of controlled substances, and racketeering, among other charges, Ron said. The other people in your videos have already been arrested and charged, but Henderson is the main one they want. What do you think will happen to him? I asked. Ron shrugged. 
Who knows, he said. One can only guess about how things are with the courts these days. It was early the next morning when I woke up to my phone ringing. I looked at my watch and saw that it was 4.30 a.m. I wondered who could be calling me at this hour. I picked up the phone and heard a man's voice. Check your text messages, the voice said before ending the call. I could tell the voice was masked and the caller did not leave his number. I opened my text messages and found one with a video attached. In the video, I saw three men, without clothes and tied hand and foot. They were unceremoniously dumped in front of a brick building. I recognized them as Henderson, Lenny, and Harvey. A sign was hung around Henderson's neck, memo to the FBI, I killed Katie West. I wondered if the FBI would get a clue. I finished watching the video and went back to sleep. I got up for hours later and went downstairs. Amy was in the kitchen frying bacon and eggs for the three of us. I hope you don't mind me trying my hand at your kit, she said. Ron gets angry if he doesn't get his bacon in the morning. Not at all, I said. I get a little irritable myself when I don't get my bacon. Help yourself. When she finished, we all sat down to breakfast. We had just finished when there was a knock on the door. I opened it and saw Ryan standing there. Can I come in? He asked. Of course, I said, inviting him to enter. I introduced him to Ron and Amy, telling him they were friends of my father-in-law. Would you like a cup of coffee or something else? I asked. He shook his head. No, Tom, I won't stay here that long, he said. I just wanted to let you know that Henderson and two of his top thugs were taken into custody in Colorado Springs early this morning. That's good, isn't it? I asked. Yes, he said. I heard they sing like canaries. There are just a few questions about how they were apprehended, but I'm sure you don't know anything about that, do you? No, I don't know, I said. I've been here all night. Ron and Amy can attest to this. Aha, uh -huh, he said. Well, I just wanted you to know. Now I'll leave you guys alone. Take care of yourself. Thanks, Ryan, I said. After he left, I looked at Ron. You don't happen to know anything about this, do you? I asked. Don't ask me questions, and I won't lie to you, he said with a knowing smile. I still advise you to call your father-in-law and thank him. I nodded my head and took out my phone. Anderson, Bill said when he answered the phone. Dad, I just wanted you to know that the police came to see me, I said. I was told that Henderson and his thugs were detained in Colorado Springs. Well, that's good news, he said. Ron told me to call and thank you. I told him. Did he do it? Bill asked. Yes, I said. So I just wanted to say thank you. You're welcome, son, he said. I understand you got a call last night. That's right, I said. Nice touch to the sign. Do you think that gave them a clue? He grinned when I said that. I sure as hell hope so, he said. We'll talk soon, son. Take care of yourself. I'll do so, dad, I said. The following Monday, I went to work and handed in my resignation. Everyone said they were very sorry to see me leave, but they understood my reasons. From there, I went to see a realtor about selling the house. I knew I had a lot of work ahead of me. We've lived in this house since the day we got married, and this place has held two decades of memories for me, as well as two decades of accumulated junk. Another week passed before the medical examiner in New York released Katie's body, as promised. Her parents took care of the funeral arrangements. I had mixed emotions about attending the service. On the one hand, I loved her exclusively for over 20 years and felt like a huge part of me died with her. On the other hand, I was torn by what she did at the end. I found myself wondering if it was really the pills Henderson gave her or if it was something else. In the end, I decided to go mainly for Bill and Alice's sake. They were kind to me, and I felt that I owed them at least that much. Jim was able to take a few days off from West Point to attend the funeral. It was nice to see him again, and we mourned Katie's death together, remembering the good times we had as a family. I decided not to tell him what she did in the end. He had always been close to his mother, and I saw no need to cloud his memories of her. 
Once that was done, I met with a lawyer about filing a lawsuit against Ryder. I wasn't sure how far this would go, but the lawyer I spoke with seemed to think a strong case could be made against Henderson and the board of directors, especially since they were all facing multiple criminal charges. The criminal trial against Henderson and the board members who participated in the two-day orgy with Caffey seemed to go on forever. The U.S. attorney in charge of the case sought the death penalty for Henderson, and the defense team filed one stupid motion after another. I contributed and witnessed what happened to me personally and listened as others testified. Brenda also took the witness stand, telling the jury that Katie wasn't the only woman Jake drugged and used as a night toy. When asked directly, she said she wasn't 100% sure if Katie and Henderson were having an affair before that fateful weekend. Video footage obtained from a search of Henderson's office appeared to indicate that Kathy had rejected most, if not all, of Henderson's early advances. However, it became clear that over time, she began to warm up to the idea of turning me into a cuckold. A search of office and residences also uncovered evidence that he was experimenting with pills. The expert witnesses, however, did not fully understand what the pills he made would actually do, but they all said that most of the compounds he formulated were definitely intended to be used as date rape pills. Through the testimony, I finally learned what really happened to Katie. It turned out that Henderson had been keeping her alive with pills and alcohol for most of the weekend. At some point in the end, she felt severe pain in her chest and fell to the floor unconscious. The men told the jury they checked her but could not find a pulse. Instead of taking her to the nearest hospital, which was only a few minutes away, they assumed she was dead. After they cleaned her up a bit, they put her in the trunk of a car and drove her to Central Park, where they buried her. When questioned by the U.S. attorney, none of those involved responded that they had any training in CPR, and none were qualified to provide a medical opinion. Their fate was sealed when a medical examiner said he found soil in her lungs that matched the soil where she was buried. In other words, he told the jury she was buried alive. I saw some of the jury members gasp when he said that. At the end of the trial, Jake, his two thugs, and everyone involved in the weekend party were found guilty of all charges. The judge decided against the death penalty and sentenced Jake to life in prison along with Lenny and Harvey. The rest were also sent to prison but received slightly lighter sentences. Civil lawsuits against Ryder and Henderson were filed in their entirety following the conclusion of the criminal trial. By the time it was over, the company had lost almost all of its customers and was in receivership. After paying me a huge amount of money, Henderson was forced to file for bankruptcy. By the time all was said and done, the consequences of Henderson's plan to cuckold me were far greater than he had ever imagined. Katie was dead, and he and his accomplices were bankrupt and in prison. His beloved company essentially disappeared, and hundreds of people were left without work. As for me, life went on. The house finally sold, and I bought a nice two-bedroom apartment. I felt a little sad when I closed the door to the house for the last time and handed over the keys to the new owner, but I had the rest of my life ahead of me that I could count on. My consultant suggested that I take some time off and perhaps go on a nice cruise where I could meet a nice young woman. So, this is what I decided to do. I booked a round-the-world cruise and, tickets in hand, hopped into a taxi that would take me to the airport. From there, I went to Miami and then all over the world. Who knows what I might find there? Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. What do you think of our story today? I feel very sorry for the husband that his wife has fallen into bad company, so to speak, and passed away because of it. What's your opinion? Write in the comments. See you in the next video.